I'm Linda Fried. I have the great honor of serving as the introducer of today's very important event, which we're very excited about, um, and also the honor of serving, of course, as the Mailman School's dean. Welcome, of course, to uh, a very exciting uh, next entry in this year's Grand Rounds on the Future of Public Health at the Mailman School. This series, from our point of view, is a critically important vehicle for bringing faculty and students together from across every part of the school to examine and debate and understand together critically important issues for the public's health that are relevant to all of us and where understanding them together can accelerate uh, significant progress and contributions. The theme for this year has been the theme of networks. Sometimes we focused on network science and data science. But in this case, um, today's talk really is about networks for building shared knowledge, which is, of course, our aspiration in general. I'm particularly delighted to welcome you to this talk, the, which is both our Grand Rounds on the Future of Public Health and the inaugural Yusuf Hamid Distinguished Lecture. This lecture series is generously funded by the Mailman School's board member and public health champion, Yusuf Hamid. Um, Dr. Hamid is both a world-renowned a scientist as well as being the chair, um, prior chairman of CIPLA, uh, a global generic pharmaceuticals company. Dr. Hamid has worked with the school to launch this series to foster the sharing of ideas in new ways across borders and continents. And uh, of course, we're particularly pleased uh, to welcome our speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. But I want to mention that another part of our partnership with Dr. Hamid is his support for the development of the Yusuf Hamid Fellowships. And of course, our inaugural class of fellows, who you'll hear more about in a moment, are here today, uh, which is one of the reasons for the timing of Dr. Reddy's, uh, inviting Dr. Reddy to launch this, uh, this program. The principal focus of the program uh, under Dr. Hamid's, with Dr. Hamid's vision and guidance and support is to develop a robust research network and stimulate new collaborations, especially in areas that have critical gaps in health-related research, where partnerships um, between this school and leading scholars in India might well help uh, bilateral learning and substantive progress. Dr. Hamid's concern has been to particularly focus on issues of health and the environment, healthcare access, and population and family health with a particular focus on chronic disease prevention, aging, and reproductive health. So um, you'll hear more about that, but for the moment, I particularly want to say how honored I feel and the school feels to be able to welcome Dr. Srinath Reddy, president of the Public Health Foundation of India, to our school and to Columbia University, and to be the first lecturer in this important series. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Mumbai office of the Columbia Global Centers um, who, uh, for their collaboration on this series and um, to say how important that collaboration has been. According to our Grand Rounds tradition, after Dr. We'll hear for a moment from uh, Kavita Siva Ramakrishnan about the fellowship program and to formally introduce Dr. Reddy. But after Dr. Reddy's remarks, we'll reserve ample time for discussion with the audience, your questions, your comments, your thoughts. And, um, and then we'll continue the conversation at our lunch afterwards, we'll, which will take place downstairs in the fourth floor conference room. And now I'm really pleased to turn this over to Dr. Kavita Siva Ramakrishnan, co-director of the Columbia Aging Center and associate professor of sociomedical sciences to introduce our esteemed guest today, Kavita. 
So good, good morning. And um, I'm faculty director of this Yusuf Hamid Fellowship Program. And it gives me really immense and huge pleasure today and almost a sense of disbelief that we've reached a stage in this program which, uh, which has been so productive, that we've reached the stage when we have this inaugural Yusuf Hamid lecture. So a couple of brief comments about how we started this journey. Uh, we began to set up these fellowships when Dean Fried, Lynn Friedman, and I visited Mumbai, we visited Gujarat, and a range of Indian public health institutions to really try to understand what were the key challenges on which the Mailman School of Public Health could partner with institutions in India to be able to address some of these key questions. And some of the thematic areas, as Dean Fried mentioned, turned out to be environmental health, access to health and medicines, and chronic disease and aging. But as we all know, we all draw a lot of programs, but there are no programs without people. And I'd like to quickly, therefore, thank the people who've been absolutely vital in setting up the Yusuf Hamid program today, the way you see it. Um, the first set of people I'd like to thank is Gary Miller and Lynn Friedman, who've been part of the selection committee of the Hamid Fellowships, Caitlin Hawk, Vanita Gowda, Bethany, a range of people who've supported us, and we wouldn't be having the program as you see it today without them. And uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Ravina Agarwal, who's been a vital member and collaborator. And without this link that we've had the with the Columbia Global Center, it's been a critical link. I don't think we'd be able to do this very vital and very innovative kind of partnership we've started globally today. And I'd also like to welcome the members from the Columbia Global Center. And now, I'd like to really quickly turn for a quick round of introductions to our first batch of Yusuf Hamid fellows, uh, who are here today, and I'd like, I'd like them to stand up as I read out their names. So I'll start with the, the fellows who've joined us here from India, who've been here for three weeks and sadly enough are now preparing to leave. Uh, I'll turn to Habib Hassan Faruqi. Uh, Habib is an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Public Health at the Public Health Foundation of India. Um, the second fellow is Surinder K.P. Jaswal. Surinder is deputy director uh, research and professor at the Center for Health and Mental Health at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And the third fellow that we welcome from India is Aditi Roy. She's, um, she's research scientist at the Center for Environmental Health at the Public Health Foundation of India. Welcome and thank you for being here. And and I'd also like to especially thank all the chairs of the various departments. Each of these fellows have been embedded in a department in the, in the school. And both faculty and chairs have been hugely welcoming. So I'd like to expand, extend a special note of thanks to the chairs in the school. Uh, and now I turn to introduce the Mailman School fellows, the Hamid fellows from the Mailman School, who are now going to be going to India. The first is Elena Ladas, who is Learner Associate Professor for Global Integrative Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, the second fellow is Jasmine McDonald. She's assistant professor, Department of Epidemiology. And then Bhavin Sampath, who is associate professor, Department of Health Policy and Management. And Mary Beth Terry, who is professor in the Department of Epidemiology. I'd also now do a, I'd like to do a quick plug for our program. If your faculty member is here, please do feel free to apply. I'd invite you cordially to apply for the next RFP for the Hamid program. And now to our very distinguished guest here today. Professor K. Srinath Reddy serves as the president of the Public Health Foundation of India, India's first public-private partnership in public health. It was set up initially with a range of partners, the Government of India, the Gates Foundation, a range of philanthropies and corporate institutions in India. And the PHFI, of which he is the president, serves really as an administrative and scientific hub that ties up with a range of Indian institutes of public health, where they address questions relating to public health capacity building, training, advocacy, and researching public health needs in India. And these institutes, for all of you who want to partner and are interested in research, are located all over. They're located in Delhi, in Gandhinagar, in Hyderabad, Bhuvaneshwar, and Shillong. Before founding the Public Health Foundation of India, and this is really when I first met Dr. Reddy, when I was a graduate student, when he was really at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And this is a word really for some of the students in the audience, apart from being an immensely well-known global health leader. Dr. Reddy is really one of the most 
he's one of the most generous intellectual mentors one can actually find. So I met him when I was finishing up a PhD and when he was at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And he was at that point heading the Department of Cardiology at Ames. He secured a medical degree from the Osmania Medical College in Hyderabad, an MD in medicine and a DM in cardiology, all from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He was also the first Indian to serve as the president of the World Heart Federation, and he served as the physician and held the pulse, I must say, of two prime ministers in India. So I have no doubt he really knows how to answer questions that we pose to him about translating public health evidence into policy advocacy. It helps to hold the pulse of prime ministers, I'm sure, Dr. Reddy. So before founding the, um, so amongst his many current roles, he also co-chairs the thematic group on health of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He co-chaired the Health Ministry Steering Committee on Health-Related Effects on Air Pollution and he was awarded the WHO Director General's Award in 2003, the Luther Terry Medal of the American Cancer Society in 2009 for leadership in global tobacco control and is an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. You can see here a lifelong devotion to addressing questions in public health, public health questions both in India but also global health challenges, and I think that makes him absolutely the perfect and ideal person here today to deliver this inaugural lecture. Welcome, Dr. Reddy. Namaste. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here at the Mailman School, and certainly a great honor to have been asked to deliver the first Yusuf Hamid lecture. The topic that I've chosen may sound like a bit of a hyperbole when I say that public health is the broadest bridge between science and society. If I had just said a bridge, it would have been a self-evident truth and would not have required much elaboration. But why do I take the risk of sounding arrogant and say that it's the broadest bridge? I suppose I'll have to use my lecture time to justify that. It was in 1896 that the modern Olympics started in Athens with the motto, faster, higher, and stronger. While there have been certainly very admirable accomplishments in the field of athletics during successive Olympics, it is indeed science that has adopted and exemplified this motto with an amazing ability to generate knowledge with great speed, with ever-increasing speed, with astounding leaps of creativity and innovation, and incredible strength of transforming human lives, sometimes terrifyingly so, transforming human lives on this planet and even beyond. But whatever be the pace and prowess of scientific advances, we must keep reminding ourselves that science has a social mission. Science, I believe, is sterile if it lacks a social purpose. It must also for that reason, connect with public policy, which steers that social purpose. I believe, again, that public policy will crumble on clay feet if it does not stand on the strong base of sound science. And particularly in these days, when science is being denied or being substituted with fake science, it is worth reiterating this while this is certainly not an original idea, but I've spelt it out in my talks and my writings several times. But then one has to define what is science and try and understand where science actually links with public policy. In my view, science is a structured, systematic, rigorous, and objective method of inquiry into natural or anthropogenic phenomena. Louis Wolpert, writing about the unnatural nature of science in his book, says, 
science is different from technology, though it's frequently confused with technology. Science yields an idea, technology yields a product. And Patricia Farah, a historian of science, says in a book, A 4,000 Year History of Science, that science is not just a final product, such as a theorem, chemical, or an instrument, but is an integral component of society interwoven with industry, business, warfare, government, and medicine. She also goes on to say that taking advantage of scientific discoveries entails making political decisions about how to use them. And it is here, I believe, that public health must serve as a very valuable guide to making those political decisions in order that science serves its social purpose with responsibility and impact. So public health must be the bridge between science and public policy for social good. But then what is public health? That itself has so many interpretations and so many definitions over the years. John Cogan, in his book, What Makes Health Public, says that there are about seven phases of public health in the way it is interpreted or presented. Public health as a political tool, public health as government business, public health as the social infrastructure, public health as a professional enterprise of public health trained health professionals, public health as a blind benefit or harm, for example, controlling alcohol consumption or drugs is beneficial to society. Public health, where the beneficiary is not identified, but it extends to an undefined group of population. Public health as conjoined beneficiaries, where there is collective good. And public health as the population's health. I would believe that the last version, that is public health as the population's health, also encompasses the preceding descriptors. And therefore, public health, in the words of the Institute of Medicine, now called the US National Academy of Medicine, is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. Now, this sounds a very satisfactory definition. But is it entirely true? It suggests that we as a society always arrive at a consensus, which is not true. It does not talk about the conflicts between different sections of society. What do we do with the tobacco industry? What do we do with the food industry, which is not homogenous? What do we do with the polluting industries? Is there a consensus? Is the society functioning collectively? I do not believe so. So I need to define public health for myself. In my view, public health identifies and influences the determinants of health at the population level to impact on health and disease at the individual level. It acts on risk factors and determinants in terms of its elucidation. But it acts in order to bring about change and impact through policy, through systems, through services, and community action. Indeed, I believe that health of the population is also shaped by science and society. As the Swedish Nobel laureate Gunnar Merdal said, health leaps out of science and draws nourishment from the totality of society. So while I do propose that health should actually act as the pathway for connecting science to society, Health itself is a product of science and society. So it is this integral relationship that we must actually identify and influence. And the cascade of determinants in public health previously focused on what acts on the individual, the classic epidemiology, which investigated beliefs which were acquired, behaviors which were practiced, and biology, which was the gene-environment interactions. But we then moved on to understand that there are more upstream influences acting at the level of the family and the community, cultural perceptions, 
socioeconomic priorities, whether you decide on having better nutrition for the family or alcohol and tobacco for the father. Pathways of availability and access of smoke-free public places, of areas where you can have safe and pleasurable physical activity, and so on. But even more dominantly in, in recent years, we have seen influences acting even further upstream at the national and global level in terms of the stage and speed of development, the distributional issues of equity, and the demand and supply issues of trade driving even the other determinants and ultimately impacting upon individual health. So public health must generate knowledge, translate knowledge, apply knowledge, and evaluate knowledge. And the beginning point, of course, is research, which generates knowledge. But then that knowledge must lead to action. Quite often, we say knowledge to action suffices, but the knowledge must also have impact. And that impact will be seen as biological, social, and economic changes. But we cannot cease with impact. That impact must also translate into equity. And we must maximize equity in all dimensions. And that ultimately is the difference that public health will make to society. Now, in terms of health equity as a philosophical construct, we began, of course, with the utilitarian philosophy of Jeremy Bentham, which spoke of the maximum good for the maximum people. But that utilitarian philosophy actually limited itself to proposing that society must advance the interests of those who contribute maximum good to the society, which suggested the productive workforce, but not necessarily the children or the elderly or the disabled. And therefore, the idea of justice came in with John Rawls, who talked about equality of opportunity. But that also had certain limitations, which then Sen tried to correct by bringing about the issue of capabilities, so the concept of capabilities, which he held up as an important element of the right to health. I think this whole argument has been very well summarized by Sridhar Venkatapuram in his book, Health Justice. He says, quote, a well-ordered society would ensure that all individuals have the capability to be healthy and at a level that is commensurate with human dignity in the modern world, which is their right. Now, we also know that health is one capability, but is shaped by many other capabilities. Education, gender, livelihoods, physical environment, multiple other capabilities. And those now have been reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals. Even avoidance of conflict, all of those matter when we see refugees either forced by climate or forced by conflict. So where their capabilities are diminished and their right to health is impeded. So I believe that the Sustainable Development Goals actually represent these multiple capabilities which interact with and influence health. As Martha Nussbaum says, we are really talking about a cluster of capabilities when we are talking of health or a meta capability. And indeed, when we think about it, despite the fact that we have 17 sustainable development goals and 167 indicators uh, for those goals and multiple targets in between, health is the best summative indicator of success in sustainable development. Therefore, the global health must set itself some goals as we move towards 2030, which is the year for attaining the SDGs. And these are accelerating progress on the Millennium Development Goals, which is maternal and child health and infectious diseases, complemented now by concerted action to control non-communicable diseases and protect mental health implementing universal health coverage, which provides the health system platform for action on all of these, but not forgetting that we must also promote the social determinants of health. So what we need are strong health systems and pro-health policies, policies in all sectors, or health, health in all policies. 
leading to better population health outcomes and improved health equity indices. So we again have to look at health as something that is actually a combination of multiple elements interacting with each other. We traditionally look at the health system in terms of what the WHO defines as the different elements, that is workforce, infrastructure, drugs, vaccines, and technologies, health financing, information systems, and governance. We do not talk much about, but nevertheless need to pay a great deal of attention to factors that actually have a greater impact on health than even the health system, that is the social, environmental, and commercial determinants of health and nutrition. Those that act at the societal level, like water, sanitation, food system, environment, social stability, and development, but those which are seen as personal factors, like income, education, occupation, social status, gender, and participation in social networks, which are nevertheless also driven substantially by social forces. But whether these are choices in the health system as to how the health system is organized and what are its priorities, or action in the area of social determinants of health or commercial determinants of health or the environmental determinants of health, it ultimately depends upon the choices we make in the nature of the political and economic system that we develop, and that drives all the other decisions. And that is where public health now has to play a greater role. Obviously, I'm not going to be discussing each one of these, but let me pick up a few to exemplify my arguments. Let me pick up the area of drugs, vaccines, and technologies, as well as food system and environment and the interactions between those two. We now live in an era where technology is rapidly progressing at a dizzying speed and influencing many elements of our life. And we often believe that technology is science. But I believe that science discovers, technology develops, and public health delivers. If we only look at the vaccines that remain still undelivered to the intended beneficiaries across the world, we see where there is a secondary translational barrier or a technology pileup if the health systems are weak and incapable of delivering it. That is such an obvious example of public health being a very important, necessary element in the delivery of the technologies that have been developed. But also, public health must also guide the nature of technologies that are needed for social good, so that the technologies are appropriately delivered and developed at an affordable uh, cost. Now, this is the latest report from the WHO, the guidelines which incorporate the recommendations on digital interventions for health system strengthening released just a week ago. But here again we see that among the various technologies that are available, they have been prioritized for public health applications. And that is where I believe public health again has to play the role of showing the way. And we have an example from our own foundation where auxiliary nurse midwives with handheld tablets in which decision support systems have been incorporated and point of care diagnostics are available in the state of Himachal Pradesh have successfully diagnosed and managed hypertension and diabetes with excellent outcomes which have lasted for 18 months and beyond. Again, where the health system is not having sufficient number of doctors for primary health care functions, here we have demonstrated how an appropriate technology can be truly transformational. But again, it is the responsibility of public health to show that this is the way technology should be deployed. Then coming to drugs, and again, this is very consistent with the person who is after whom this lecture is named, Dr. Yusuf Hamid. The whole area of drugs is around access, whether it's generics or price controls or pooled public procurement or trade agreements, it is to ensure access to essential drugs at an affordable cost. 
whether it is insulin which is dominating your congressional hearings now as to why people are dying because of non-availability of insulin at affordable prices, or anti-cancer drugs which have agitated multinationals when India went in for a compulsory licensing, or new antimicrobials or biologicals. The challenge is how do we ensure access? And here you can see for a drug which is now known to be curative for hepatitis C treatment, the prices vary markedly across the countries. The fact that India has pretty low, value, uh, low price is because Gilead has, in its wisdom, franchised it out to four and now I think 11 companies to produce it in India at a much cheaper rate and distribute it in India. Now, if it can be done at a low cost in India, why not elsewhere? Why should other countries really have to spend so much of money and make it so utterly unaffordable for the people who need it? So these are questions that do come up. And of course, Dr. Hamid has been a pioneer in breaking access barriers by taking on a major multinational company and supplying antiretrovirals to South Africa at a very low cost by producing them in the generic form. And for that, the multinational company sued the Mandela government. Now, can you imagine a company suing Mandela government? But it did happen. But ultimately, thanks to public protest, indignation, including by medical students in American universities, the company had to beat a retreat. And Yusuf Hamid emerged as a champion. And India could actually produce these generics because of a political choice made on public health considerations. India used to resort to product patenting earlier, but in 1971 made a radical shift to process patenting. That means you can produce the same drug, even if it is under patent, by modifying the process a bit. Now, this generated a whole class of generic manufacturers who produced unbranded generics and then went on to produce generic, ge, uh, branded generics. And India became the pharmacy of much of the world, supplying cheaper drugs. In 2005, we had to move to product patenting because we entered the World Trade Organization. But nevertheless, we built up sufficient strength in the meanwhile to address the essential needs of our people and of many other countries as well in terms of life-saving medicines. Now, that is a choice which was political, but steered on the grounds of public health. Now, similar considerations led to the Doha Declaration, where, which provided TRIPS flexibilities, where on public health considerations, countries could employ compulsory licensing and other methods in order to make sure that access to drugs remained protected. But many of the free trade agreements that have come up since, bilateral or multilateral, have now gone in for TRIPS plus provisions, which undermine the TRIPS flexibilities, prevent countries from undertaking compulsory licensing, or preventing export of generic drugs to third countries, and so on. That's why the United Nations Secretary General's high-level panel on access to medicines in September 2016 remarked that many governments have not used the flexibilities available under the TRIPS agreement for various reasons ranging from capacity constraints to undue political and economic pressures from the states and corporations, both express and implied. Political and economic pressures placed on governments to forego the use of TRIPS flexibilities violates the integri integrity and legitimacy of the system of legal rights and duties created by the TRIPS agreement as reaffirmed by the Doha Declaration. Again, this is an arena where trade, politics, economic interests, and public health collide and come into conflict. But here is a ringing affirmation of the primacy of the need to protect public health. And that is where public health must guide that entire debate. Moving to climate change. Now, all of you are too familiar 
with the consequences of climate change on health. But it bears reiteration to say that there are physical and mental effects of heat, vector borne diseases, water borne diseases, extreme weather events playing havoc, exacerbated air pollution, increased risk of chronic diseases, climate refugees, and an impact on agriculture and nutrition security. But whatever be the manifestation of this, the poor are the worst victims, and therefore, again, there is damage to equity. Now, obviously, in each of these areas, whether it's environmental degradation with forced migration, civil conflict, mental health impacts, loss of jobs and income, or degraded living conditions and social inequities with exacerbation of existing social and health inequities and vulnerabilities, or changes in vector ecology when, because of the heat, human beings lie listless and wilting in the heat, the mosquitoes become athletic and climb to higher heights. And therefore, you see malaria spreading to areas which were hitherto protected. Then we have air pollution and increasing allergens. When the carbon dome descends, the impact of air pollution and ozone concentration at the ground level increase, again, causing a huge amount of damage, water quality impact, as well as water and food supply, and extreme weather events and extreme heat events, as we have said. But let's look at only one of the impacts, uh, one of the manifestations, which is on food and agriculture. We live in a world currently where food systems are threatening the environment, and environmental degradation from a variety of sources is threatening the food systems. And this will get worse if we don't change. Now, we know in this relationship between agriculture, food, and nutrition, urbanization, diminished arable land, changing food prices, water usage, increasing global population are all playing a role, but climate change is coming in as one of the biggest intervening factors. The world would need to produce 60% more food to feed a population of 9 billion in 2050. If we look at climate change through the nutrition lens, by year 2100, 40% of the world's land surface will likely experience altered climates. Agricultural output is projected to fall by 2% per decade due to impact of climate change on crop and livestock production. Food demand is projected to rise by 14% per decade due to population growth, urbanization, and poverty reduction. Also remember, the age profile of the populations will be changing. The proportion of children will be decreasing, the proportion of adults would be increasing, and adults consume more food than children. So this is the reason why you're going to see, for multiple reasons, the demand for food would increase, even as the supply of food would decrease. Higher production of staple crops will not be enough to make agriculture more resilient to climate change, or better able to address the world's need for improved diets. Nutrient-rich crops are more susceptible to droughts, pests, diseases, and temperature fluctuations. Actually, the production of staples is going to go down, but what is even more worrisome is the detriment to the non-staples, which are more nutrient-rich. The higher carbon dioxide in atmosphere may reduce the nutrient content of st staple crops, and soil degradation also reduces nutrient quality. Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, which are actually going to be seeing a population increase, are particularly prone to productivity losses from climate change because major staples in these regions are often already grown above their optimum temperature. They're already operating at a very high temperature level where the production is going to be limited and the nutrient quality is going to be affected. And with every one degree additional rise in temperature, there is likely to be a 10% yield loss. And that's where we'll be living on the razor's edge of nutrition security. Therefore, agriculture and food systems will have to be reconfigured to assure affordable access to diversified diets that are calorically adequate, but also nutritionally appropriate to each person at every stage of his or her life in a sustainable manner. Therefore, we need climate-resilient or climate-smart agriculture with crop diversity, 
especially non-staples and fruits and vegetables. With rising heat, the fruits ripen early and rot early. Sustainable fish production, fiber-preserving food grain processing, non-atherogenic and non-diabetogenic processed food products, food safety against carcinogens. Well, this is, appears to be a very rational and reasonable recipe. But is it happening? Here is the so-called Harvard food plate. Whether you actually agree with it or not, I do not know how Columbia reacts to Harvard. But nevertheless, uh, we generally agree that this is a reasonable philosophy, that at least half of the plate must be having uh, fruit and vegetables, and the remaining, of course, should have other, other nutrients in balance, other food items in balance. But what we are actually producing, according to FAO, is far different from what is ideally recommended by nutritionists as a healthy diet. And therefore, our production forces are totally out of sync with human nutrition needs. And here, political choices will have to be made. Commercial choices will have to be made. And it is public health raising the banner of nutrition security alongside sustainable environment that has to lead the way. But of course, we scientists are also great in confusing the matters. You only have to look at diet and NCDs and we find the controversies exist. Fats, nobody knows. One day saturated fats are in, one day fat saturated fats are out. Carbohydrates, salt, eggs. One egg, one egg in three days. Fish, fowl, flesh, proteins, dairy, fruits and vegetables, antioxidants. In every one of this, there is some controversy that we create. But we must also recognize in our humility that we have become a bit too reductionist in our approach. While we focused a lot on specific individual nutrients and then moved with some reluctance to individual food items, we have now recognized that it is dietary patterns that matter, whether it is Mediterranean diet or Okinawa diet, it's a prudent, balanced diet that matters. It's the dietary pattern that matters. So again, we need to remind ourselves, even as we interpret science, that sci the spectrum of science is reductionist in content, but holistic in context. The individual, it's like a spectrum. The individual colors of the rainbow are brilliant and wonderful in terms of their attractive colors. It is only when they fuse together that you get the real white light which shows you the truth. And that is what science has to be holistic in context. And in terms of the food environment, we need to look at the food transformation and consumer demand, consumer purchasing power, agricultural production, market and trade systems, all of which actually influence the food environment and diet quality. So food supply, food marketing, food transformation and retail, and food demand. And all of these will influence food choices. So the nutrition policy of the 20th century focused on technology-aided production. The emphasis was an individual behavior change. Eat this, don't eat this. 21st century must focus on both production and consumption, patterns which are compatible with sustainable development. And emphasis on systems thinking for broader societal change, rather than looking at individual nutrients or individual crops. But this is not easy. As Howard Nemerov, in his letter to the Congress of the United States, when it entered the third century in 1989, wrote in a poetic form, praise without end the go-ahead zeal of whoever it was invented the wheel, but never a word for the poor soul's sake that thought ahead and invented the break. So we need to put a few brakes on the consumerism. And for this, we need to use the power of policy effectively. In terms of diet, we have seen how preventive uh, the impact of uh, policy can be. In terms of Mauritius, where the price of edible oils was switched in the public distribution system from palm oil to soya. And that automatically changed the population consumption patterns. In Poland, the import of fruit and vegetables and healthy fats greatly changed the trajectory of cardiovascular mortality. And in Finland, which has been the poster child of prevention, we have seen how changing in farming and marketing practices from 
dairy farms to berry farms, as they say, and community education transformed the situation. And we are seeing new initiatives like tax on sugar sweetened beverages in Mexico, food labeling, <coughs> reduced salt in processed foods, ban on trans fats, advertising restrictions, and so on, all coming into play. In terms of tobacco, we have seen evidence from multiple countries, including low and middle income countries, that taxation, advertising bans, smoke-free policies, and health warnings are all very effective. Indeed, in the UK, between 1981 and 2000, about 48.1% of the mortality averted was attributable to reduced smoking. But then, we are challenged. We have said the state has no business to intervene. It's a matter of free choice. You cannot impose a nanny state. That's a very typical British term. You cannot impose a nanny state. But then we must recognize that the government has a responsibility to protect public health. And while the market does exist, we should try and ensure that the market aligns with the public health goals rather than conflicts with it. Paul Collier, an economist at Oxford, says in his book, uh, in his recent book on the future of capitalism, we need an active state, but we need one that accepts a more modest role. We need the market, but harnessed by a sense of purpose, securely grounded in ethics. Now, wonderful formulation. But when you talk about a sense of purpose guiding the market, does it currently exist? Can it be ensured? Till that purpose is clearly aligned to public interest and ethics are defined in terms of protecting common good, governments should not relax their regulatory role. We do need public-private partnerships, as they say, PPPs, but PPPs have been often been defined by cynics as partnerships for private profit. We in Public Health Foundation of India redefined it as partnership for public purpose. Define the public purpose, define the deliverables, and define the accountability mechanisms. Then it'll work, otherwise not. So, we are dealing with the market, which now is the reigning deity. But markets cannot be autonomous entities totally impervious to public interest. Therefore, they will have to be sensitive and aligned to public interest, particularly public health interest. And for these, we require increasing consumer consciousness, steering industry practices with suitable regulation, you need a carrot and stick approach with some incentives and some disincentives, or as I would like to call it, a frozen carrot approach, because regulation can be both a carrot and a stick. And a national policy framework, which provides also that kind of political, economic, and social motivators. But then we are told again, it's a matter of individual choice. You're impeding individual choice. But we from the public health community must remove those layers and say that choice of an individual can be conscious, which can be well-informed or ill-informed based on information that is available, or conditioned by aggressive marketing and promotion, as in the case of tobacco, alcohol, and so on, or conditioned by cultural factors and peer influences, or compelled by are constrained by economic factors, availability and affordability. I may be quite conscious of the fact that I, may have, I must have five helpings of fruit and vegetables a day, but if the prices are extremely costly, then how do I manage? Finally, in terms of the economic growth and relationship to public health, we now recognize that there is a bidirectional relationship between economic growth and population health, but also that at any level of economic growth, equity matters because countries with a greater level of income and other equity actually have better gains from economic growth than countries with high levels of inequity. But at the same time, we recognize that the individual level, poverty and individual health also have a bidirectional relationship, poverty creating greater susceptibility for ill health and ill health pitchfork pitchforking people into poverty. So we come to universal health coverage, which tries to tackle some of these in terms of the individual vulnerability. And here we have to, again, define 
a balance between horizontal equity and vertical equity. Horizontal equity is a universal access to a common set of services through an essential health package, which is available to everybody. But recognizing that health inequalities already exist and some population groups are more vulnerable than others, we may need additional targeted services for disadvantaged or vulnerable groups. Therefore, they get services or resources beyond the essential health package, which is universal. Again, here, public health must educate the policymakers how to bridge these equity gaps. Well, William Gibson says, the future is already here. It is just not very evenly distributed. Universal health coverage is essential in terms of pro financial protection. It is necessary, but not sufficient. We also need multi-sectoral action on social determinants of health and empowered communities which can benefit from a rights-based approach to health. And even dazzling new scientific knowledge must be examined through the equity lens. Like, for example, when we look at the intergenerational impact of undernutrition, we know that if a pregnant mother has poor nutrition, there are epigenetic changes which influence the girl fetus in utero and predispose to adult cardiovascular and chronic disease, diabetes and chronic diseases. But what we do not often recognize is that if the, girl, if the fetus is a girl, the developing oocytes in that fetus are also impacted by some of these changes so that it's not only the child that is yet to be born, but the child that is yet to be conceived who will suffer these consequences, and that is during one pregnancy. So similarly, we recognize that when there is inequality and that creates poverty, the maternal breast milk oligosaccharides are diminished. They're not useful for the fetus, but they're useful for the microbiome, which in turn provides nutrition and immunological protection to the growing child. And this can result in health disorders. So inequality breeds inequality there. Similarly, when we talk about epigenetic changes due to different environmental exposures, whether it's air pollution or tobacco or other kinds of environmental exposures, again, the poor are much more exposed and they will suffer the health disorders much more. So again, inequality begets inequality. So coming back to the concept of equality of opportunity of John Rawls, we have R.H. Tony, a British economist, of the 1920s and 30s, who says that merely talking about equality of opportunity is decorous drapery. Because you may have created an open road, but not an equal start. So unless you act upon the social determinants of health, you're not providing that equal start. So again, it becomes the responsibility of public health to go beyond equality of opportunity through universal health coverage, but really take into account the need for action on social determinants of health. So whether we are talking about genes and epigenetics and are preoccupied with various omics, we must recognize the social determinants, the alteration of the microbiome in lifetime with changing environments, and our environment itself influencing epigenetics are all interlinked. And therefore, it is these linkages that we must identify and move from science into public policy. So the purpose of public health research is to provide evidence-based, context-specific, resource-sensitive, culturally compatible, and equity-promoting recommendations for policy and practice. I prefer to use the term evidence-informed rather than evidence-based, context-relevant rather than context-specific because there are different areas which could actually uh, have slightly uh, similar specificity, and resource-optimizing rather than resource-sensitive. And since culture is dynamic, it will be culturally adaptive rather than just culturally compatible. While context could be altered, Resources could be increased. Culture could be modified. Evidence and equity remain non-negotiable. They have to be fundamental for policy and practice. Therefore, policy needs interdisciplinary research. Bismarck in the 19th century said, 
that there are two things that should not be watched while they're being made, sausages and public policy. Uh, rather, uh, sorry, spectacle, or unedifying spectacles to watch. But even an enlightened policy will require scientific credibility, evidence and rationale, which requires biomedical and epidemiological and clinical research, financial feasibility, is it cost-effective or affordable? Health economics research. Operational stability, is it sustainable or scalable, which requires health systems research. Political viability, is the community ready and receptive? It requires social science research. Therefore, the compass of research must extend from molecules to markets. Arena of advocacy and action must extend from risk factors to rights. Now, when we're talking about cell to society, research now needs the joint efforts of multiple disciplines, ranging from molecular biologists to clinicians to epidemiologists to social scientists to bioinformaticians. You know, Are we ready? So in Public Health Foundation of India, we believe public health actually embraces multiple disciplines, epidemiology and allied sciences, environmental and life sciences, economics and management, humanities and social sciences, all of them are relevant and provide the platform for confluence of knowledge which is now going to guide public health action. Therefore, the role of universities is to create T-shaped individuals. Individuals who have a depth of expertise in a particular area, but have the breadth of orientation to understand the relevance of other disciplines, have the cultural adaptability to engage with others, and try and develop that kind of transdisciplinary research environment, which is problem solving for society. So in terms of understanding health, it was mentioned that I held the pulse of two prime ministers, but I believe that the lifeline of human health extends from pulse to planet. Persons who are individuals, people, that is communities, and populations that are nations, but also the whole planetary health itself. And unless we understand this connectivity, we'll be failing in our duty as public health professionals connecting science to society. Rudolf Virchow, a famous pathologist, founder of the Anthropological Society of Germany, and considered the father of social medicine in Europe, said in the 19th century that should medicine ever fulfill its great ends, it must enter into the larger political and social life of our time. It must indicate the barriers which obstruct the normal completion of the life cycle and remove them. Should this ever come to pass, medicine, whatever it may then be, will become the common good of all. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that medicine today is public health, and it must enter and influence the political and social life, and thereby connect science to social good and fulfill its mission. As Simone Weil said, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. Thank you very much for your attention.